for this next story, I do have a BlackBerry pager that's like 20 years old, and I, I was going to get a little button effect where I could make it blow up on screen, but I thought too soon. So this past week, I, I've watched the Lebanon kind of Hezbollah north border of Israel battle kind of percolate. They're doing it slow motion. They throw some rockets, they throw some missiles, you know, it goes back and forth, stuff blows up, and it's not affected either country totally to the national level, but it's been like smoldering for a while. So while Israel has these fronts open in the south with Hamas and they're, they're invading the West Bank, which did nothing over there, uh, they couldn't help with themselves but to start playing harder ball with uh, Hezbollah. And so the story unfolds in a way that is... Uh, at one point, like it's devious and brilliant and military strategy. Like you got to applaud the logistical ability to intercept someone else's logistics without them knowing like that. Right. Um, and because Syria and Iran are sovereign countries, they, these people can, they're, they're fine to fight with Israel. I, I don't have a problem. Like I don't have a, like they can fight. It's not a, it's not a case where like they have artificial prison and these people are women and children. It's a whole different situation. So while we're going to cover this story, it's like I'm not going to say that uh, doing such warfare is inhumane. It's unsporting to take out civilians and not have, like, if you have the ability to bomb their pagers and make them blow up, don't you have an ability to know where the pager is and know what other devices are around the pager, for instance, right? This one's in a grocery store. We're going to take that off the list. This one's in a preschool. We're going to take that off. Oh, this guy's just over here and he's likely a jihadi. Then that's the, that's the rules of warfare. That's not women and children and civilians. But when you indiscriminately just send some stuff out into the marketplace and you blow it up, there's a lot of videos of the pagers blowing up in various cases and various places. And uh, so from a warfare between nations strategy it's definitely going to cause pause on the other side. They're going to second guess their devices. They're going to have to come up with new scanning techniques. They were trying to be low tech and Israel finally adjusted to like, Oh, we can mess with your low tech stuff too. Right. And then after those 2,400 pagers blew up, you had the, you know, hundreds of walkie talkies that they went to and reverted to blowing up the next day. And then the reports of the cars. So what I have in this media block is, uh, independent media coverage of it in a way that we would strongly disagree and this would allow you to see like dude they're talking about human beings and they're kind of being gleeful about it and we don't have a stake in this war we're not funding it like this is not america we're, we're not doing this stuff right so that's it's like a dark schadenfreude like taking pleasure in other people's pain that you're seeing in in this uh the crowder clip and what's the other clip because Jimmy Dore does call him out on it. So there there, it, there are some people that are like overly gleeful about the whole thing that maybe you shouldn't be so gleeful. Like maybe you should consider the situation. Uh, and I don't like to see anyone get blown up. Like whether it's their hip or their crotch or their face or whatever. Like those people didn't necessarily take any action against the people that are actually doing the bombing, for instance. So there's... Uh, philosophical argument of the le levels but there's also like the technical level so we do have two count them one two ai telly videos in this block because ai telly we first encountered them during the first trump assassination attempt uh has a way of taking these situations and visually explaining them in a way that is uh, i thought it was at least palatable if not you know overly accurate because there's not a lot of data but this is plausibly how they would carry out such a uh, intelligence operation uh so we have one of the pagers and the walkie talkies and then we'll have uh the last clip will be jimmy door gleeful reactions to pager attacks by deranged israel supporters he doesn't include crowder in there but i think it's just probably because he didn't see the crowder clip that we're about to show you so um I apologize in advance. This is the third Crowder clip in tonight's show, but it's different topics and it was good coverage. And I was driving back on vacation. I had limited access to review media this past week. So I wanted to represent the important stories. I think that even though it's a, 
probably I'm neutral on this, so it's not an opposite side of what I'd be on, but I would like hold to a neutral position on this topic more so than the immediate buy-in that just because Israel blew up some people that it's a good thing because like they've lost their credibility and burned their trust recently with that type of stuff. So uh, for discerning minds, we have the following block. Here is uh, beep, beep, boom, as Crowder calls it. God, I love it. A Christian band over is the Jewish guys killing Islamic guys. Let's start talking about terrorist pagers. <laughs> I saw this story yesterday. I was like, no way. Well, and there's been some misreporting out there, yeah. just to be clear. So we want to correct the record. But, but, but the, I will say this. The gist is correct. Uh, terrorists <laughs> had Sorry. terrorists tried to purchase pagers uh, to, to, you know, be more effective in killing Jews. Yes. And uh, somehow they were intercepted and the pagers were used to um, kill terrorists. That's, that's the fun part. Turnabout is fair play. <laughs> but don't take my word for it. Uh, here's actually a clip, I believe, from Al Jazeera discussing the pagers being used by Hezbollah in Lebanon uh, blowing up. Just to update you on what we are covering by way of breaking news uh, this hour, dozens of members of the Lebanese armed group Hezbollah appear to have been uh, simultaneously targeted um, by their pages being remotely detonated. We don't know the full extent of their injuries. We don't know the full scale of the number of people that may have been killed as a result of that. But what we do know is that Hezbollah has described this as a major security breach. I'd say so. <laughs> <laughs> They're in the house. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. They're coming for you, Barbara. So 12, <laughs> 12 people uh, have been killed that we know uh, of so far. That we know of so yeah. far. 2,800 in injured, including, by the way, uh, I believe the Iranian ambassador to Lebanon. We have Interesting. That there from uh, why would Iran's ambassador to Lebanon have one of the Hezbollah pagers? He could have been pager adjacent. I don't think so. <laughs> he was, it was just uh, an accident. Yeah. Uh huh. Well, and uh, I have to warn picture. you, the, the following video um, does include some portions where you will see terrorists being partially blown up. I don't know if we need to dump portions of this. Just so you can see some of the fallout, I also warn you that what you're about to watch is a lot of fun. <laughs> God, I love it. A Christian band over is the Jewish guys killing Islamic guys. It is fun. The world comes together sometimes. It yes. Does. And pagers, look, pagers are tricky. Yeah, they are. The old technology, it, it can be unreliable or unstable even, even when it's not being intercepted by Mossad. Mm -hmm. Six six five. <laughs> My wife is a pervert. I'm gonna have to call her like God. Why? <sighs> sorry. No, it's all right. I'm sorry. It's just the cape and your creepy smile it just kind of freaked me out. What are you doing? I was I was looking for somebody to show my new trick to, and you're no, really... dude, magic freaking blows. I'm not doing this again. Oh come on, dude. just real quick. Just hold this for me, and then I'll hold that. I'm oh, fine. I'm thirsty anyway. And then you hold that. <laughs> For new Mug Club members, there's an entire back catalog of Billy the Magician, so I'll rest in peace. Yes. Kind of a dick. Is, yeah. Not well, a, maybe he survived. He may have survived. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Well, could be like one of the Hezbollah. Hezbollah. He could be 12 of the 2,800. <laughs> I'm kind of surprised that the number is that low. I know. That 2,800 are injured and only 12 have been killed. The only way that this could have been more targeted is if they had a Jewish like reverse pickpocket physically walk up and place M80s into their jacket. <laughs> like at a certain at a certain very point true. you have to go, okay, this is clearly very targeted, designed to minimize collateral damage. E you know, it's war. You just swear the destruction of all Jews and annihilation, you know, you can expect a few exploding pagers, or at very least some snapping gum. So <laughs> it's a couple of handshakes. Yes. <laughs> this is, oh, God. Me. Tricky Jew. 
<laughs> so there has been some misreporting. Yes. Uh, out there. Let me, let me just clarify for those of you, who, and we make the references available every episode. Link in the description or go to lightwithcutter.com. Uh, so has, let me go through the timeline. Hezbollah, terrorist organization, ordered pagers. Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, there were some reports out there that said these pagers were manufactured by this Taiwanese company, Gold Apollo. Um, they were actually manufactured in Budapest by this company called BAC Consulting. Okay, and then I believe there was a licensing yeah. agreement. Then it appears that these pagers were tampered with during the supply chain from the New York Times. It says the explosive material, as little as one to two ounces, was implanted next to the battery in each pager. And here's the best part. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right before the pagers exploded, uh, they received a message from Hezbollah leadership. So think about it. The terrorists are going to raise it up to face level. Like, beep, beep. Oh, my new pager. Have a blast. What? <laughs> Whatever it is. <laughs> Mazel tov? That but seems suspicious. What coming is what? You're my sex bomb. I don't know. Oh, no. Shalom, shalom. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, like, like that is you do have to appreciate a clever kill. I know, and that it they paused it for just like a couple of seconds after the page was received. Like so yes. if you if you happen to leave it, you know, in your pocket where it was, there go your balls. If you happen to leave it on your hip, there goes part of your hip. Yeah. And and if you happen to be holding it, well then you're one of the twelve. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think the original plan was to have them like pick it up and check it. Yeah. In their face yeah. and then go boom. I can't I can't what did they use a quirky keyboard? I can't oh, no! I mean it was a good plan. Yes. You know. Hey, is this supposed to be ticking? Shakes it like a Christmas present. Yeah, yeah those those uh those clear ones wouldn't have worked, huh? No, they wouldn't work. So. What is this weird putty inside of it? What is it? It looks like a mini bowling ball it? with a fuse. Why is there an LED light blinking? <laughs> Boom. And by the way, this was Hopefully. this was not even their first plan as oh, far as yeah, capturing. Yeah. You know, you use what it is that they know that they're comfortable with, these yes. terrorists. Yes. This was plan B. Plan A was, well, you can see for yourself. It seems like that was. Oh, <laughs> come on. Actually, that was. This seems was Plan that. C. Plan B was that, but with a goat. With a goat. Oh. <laughs> you were there. It's not just a hey, stereotype. No, it's real. There are a lot of it's people. Real. In you the, get a goat and a kid. Jackpot. That guy <laughs> can die a happy terrorist, and some did. So, <laughs> so bad. The Hezbollah leader. Oh, that's uh, my side chick. <laughs> Syed Hassan Nasrallah has said that they've been moving to more low tech equipment in order to be blinding of Israel's intelligence Funny gathering. Funny choice of words. Which is just, yes, it's just. <laughs> As you hold a pager up to your eyes. And, and what's funny is this was still too much technology because the Jews found a way through, so they're moving to, like, carrier pigeons. <laughs> a trebuchet or something. Yeah, I told you, it's all about cyber security. <laughs> yes. It's just, you got two cans and a string. Yeah, exactly. I just, <laughs> I just love the idea of that part of the world going, you know what we need? Less technology. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> Because it is the devil's playground. Nope. By devil, I mean <laughs> Jew. This is an actual Reuters headline from July. It says, how Hezbollah used pagers and couriers to counter Israel's high-tech surveillance. Well, I well, guess that'll work for you for a while. Can you imagine being a terrorist now, though, in, 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 in any of part I of can. the world right now that is focusing on Israel? Like, no phone, pager, piece of technology ever will be safe again for you. You'd be like, no, 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 no. You yeah. can't you can just end your quest to and, kill the Jews. Well, that'd be, that would <laughs> be the, the right thing just to do. Just give up on it. Yeah. But it, it just it plants that seed for every piece of technology that they ever touch again. Yeah, and I've seen some people, and look, let, I'm going to be honest with you, the, the, the very strong streak of anti-Semitism is, is baked into the current Democratic Party. But there is, there, there is some of that on the right. There are some people you know, who go around the bend, and I've seen a few, and I've seen some people out there saying that, well, this is actually, we should be, we should be most concerned about the fact that Israel could do this to our <laughs> technology. You know, they haven't, but I will tell you this, it does bring up a point that we do have vulnerabilities as far as technology here in the United States. So Hezbollah is not all wrong. Now, our vulnerabilities uh, are not being exploited largely by the Jews, but, uh, well, let me give you some examples. So, like Tesla, for example, China is responsible for 40% of the battery supply chain. Yeah. Well, companies like Apple, you know, you, you have places in China, Hong Kong, they make up half of the suppliers. TCL is another example. You may have one of their uh, electronics. Since 2019, the Chinese company, they've sold 25 million televisions in America. A lot of these are smart televisions, to be clear. So, yeah, we've talked about TikTok. Um, if you want to talk about our vulnerabilities, it's not always 
a hilarious, mind you, pager bomb. It can be people collecting data, mm -hmm. private information. You may not know how exposed you are. So I do think it's a valid point to bring up, but if, and this is the consequence of misinformation or unsubstantiated information. If you have someone out there looking for a Jew behind every piece of technology, scared of the Jews in the United States, and I'm not saying that the Israeli government is beyond any form of corruption, absolutely not. But if they're looking for this as the primary threat, you're going to miss mm. the constant the constant weaknesses and vulnerabilities that we have that you actually don't even, you pass by on a day-to-day -day basis that involves who, who? Well, China. Let's be really clear about that. They do not have your best interests at heart. They're not an ally in any way, shape, or form. It's a communist nation. Yeah. So I do think it does bring up a valid discussion uh, relating to our own security, because I don't think China's going to, you know, give give us uh, exploding pagers. No, but that's the thing. Like, it, you know, people have put, you know, some really stupid people online, and you know who you are, have put out, the, you know, posts basically saying like other countries could do this to us, and I'm like, well, only if they pack the phone or pager if you have one with explosives first, and know that you're going to go to the Apple Store or Android Store, or whatever, and buy that specific phone. Yes, you don't understand. Like, they, they know exactly where you are right now. Anyway. Anyway, this is the least of your concerns that they're going to like blow you up with your phone. Right. They didn't just like go, hey, we found a hack in the phone that's like a stock phone and make it blow up. They had to put explosives inside of it, you morons. Yeah. Like if you think that's going to happen, fine. And, the, and, and, the, ways. and the leaders of Hezbollah didn't, they didn't even wand them. No. Just think about that. Like, like, no dogs. No I mean, dogs. You're, you're one of the primary <laughs> funder and instigator of terrorism globally, and you can't just like get a bomb sniffing dog in yeah. oh, your giant shipment of pagers? <laughs> they, don't, they don't think about these kind of yeah. things, man. That's I mean, why Rex. How do you think we found half the terrorists we found in Afghanistan, dude? I know. The right. Cell phone. I'm not, I mean, We've been I, tracking you for three days, watching your every move. Yes. And you're I, like, where did you guys come from? What? Yes. My phone? <laughs> 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 I better get another one. Yes. <laughs> we'll track that one, too. Like, all right. Uh, Israel, Make job easy. Israel hasn't responded yet, but there are reports of uproarious laughter coming from Twitter. I can imagine. So, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I see you're still watching. You follow. Hezbollah reportedly ordered around 5,000 pagers from Taiwan, a country known for producing about 90% of the world's most advanced semiconductors. These pagers were destined for Lebanon. However, what makes this story particularly intriguing is what allegedly happened during the shipment process. At some point along the way, a spy agency is believed to have intercepted the shipment and tampered with the pagers. They discreetly altered the internal components, replacing one of the two identical batteries with a hidden explosive device. This modification was done so subtly that it went unnoticed. Once the changes were made, the altered pagers were quietly sent back to Hezbollah as if nothing had happened. To help you understand better about the explosive pager, let's take a look at how it works. At its core, the battery powers the entire device. This is the speaker and emits audio alerts to notify the user of incoming messages, the motor adds a physical vibration alert, making the pager effective in silent mode. The radio antenna coil receives wireless signals like VHS, and the microprocessor converts these signals into readable messages. In short, these are often low-tech and difficult to track. Inside a typical pager, you'll notice these components working together, particularly the batteries which power the device. Now let's consider a hypothetical scenario. Imagine you're looking at two identical batteries inside the pager. Although this is speculative, if we were part of a spy agency, we might consider disguising one of the two identical batteries for a different purpose. One battery would provide the necessary power for the device, while the other could potentially serve as an explosive cleverly concealed within the pager. To expand on this theory, an alkaline AA battery weighs approximately 23 grams. Interestingly, reports in the news have mentioned that an explosive weighing about 20 grams was detonated. This similarity in weight lends some plausibility to the idea that a battery could be used as a disguised explosive device. We believe there was a timer for triggering this explosive that can disable or unalive an adult if placed at the correct time. Since 2,750 were injured, which cannot be a coincidence. In one instance, a pager explosion occurred at a grocery store, and a small handheld device, seemingly just another pager, was carried by a possible Hezbollah operative. It unexpectedly detonated, causing injuries to the user. The explosion, though localized, inflicted harm and sowed fear among those present. This raises the question, why did Hezbollah begin using pagers instead of simple mobile phones? Well, it all started with the forward shaker bombings better explained in the video ahead. 
after the October 7 attack and the Druze football field missile incident. The Israeli spy agency started planning the assassination of Fouad Shukr. They did this by hacking into the mobile network of the Hezbollah military commanders. Let's delve into the details of how this assassination unfolded. Southern Beirut, Lebanon serves as a stronghold for Hezbollah, where Fouad Shukr resided in a fortified seven-story building. This building was not only his home, but also served as a base of operations, with his office strategically located on the second floor, allowing him to oversee and coordinate critical military activities. On the day of the assassination, Fouad Shukr was working in his office, likely engaged in the planning and communication that were vital to Hezbollah's operations. Unbeknownst to him, Israeli intelligence was closely monitoring his movements and communications. According to reports, Israeli intelligence managed to intercept a Hezbollah phone call, which played a crucial role in the assassination plot. The intercepted call was manipulated to deliver a false directive, instructing Fouad Shukr to return to his residence on the top floor of the same building. The urgency of the message was designed to make the commander believe it was a matter of immediate importance. This clever ruse was a deliberate attempt to isolate Fouad Shukr in a specific location, ensuring that the strike would be as effective as possible. The plan succeeded as soon as confirmation was received that the commander had entered his seventh floor apartment. The final phase of the operation was set into motion. An aircraft, possibly an F-16, was dispatched to carry out the precision strike. Equipped with a laser-guided bomb, similar to the highly advanced SPICE weapon. The aircraft locked onto the target. The free-fall guided weapon, traveled with pinpoint accuracy, was released and struck the building with devastating force, causing a massive explosion that obliterated the seventh floor and claimed the life of Fouad Shukr injured a couple of residents living in it. But this doesn't even compare to the mystery of this assassination in the Iranian guest house. Who did it and how was it done? We will present you with three scenarios and let you, the audience, decide. One involves a bomb being planted in all three rooms and blew up possibly by a remote control. The second scenario describes alleged Mossad operative waiting until around 2 a.m. to launch a short-range missile at this part of the guest house. The third scenario involves using a stealth jet to hit the target. All these in the video ahead, so don't miss a beat. But first, let's examine the surroundings. This is a five-story guest house located in the northern part of Iran. The guest house is situated near the Sadabad complex and is surrounded by mountainous regions. It is also open on all sides. This building has around five to six floors with different rooms on each level. For now, we'll focus on a particular room on the western side of the building. Let's look at scenario one. Ismail Haniya, a senior leader of Hamas, was assassinated by an explosive device covertly smuggled into the Tehran guest house where he was staying. This account is according to seven Middle Eastern officials, including two Iranians and an American official. It's important to note that this is one of the most heavily guarded areas in Iran, under the protection of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. For alleged Mossad operatives to infiltrate this protected area where the streets were thoroughly secured was one of the most daring and well-planned maneuvers they could undertake. From this top angle, we can see Hamiya's car entering this part of the building. He stayed in this section of the guest house, probably in this specific portion, which has been reported to be his favorite area whenever he visits Iran. This is the tricky part. According to several reports, the bomb was planted two months ago, allegedly by operatives possibly either Iranian or Mossad. Let's consider C4 as the explosive used in this case. It typically consists of a remote controller and a main warhead which is composed of explosives, a plastic binder, a plasticizer to make it malleable, and usually a marker or odorizing tagged chemical. Although small C4 can destroy a room with a blast radius of around 4 to 20 feet. Here's how it might have worked. The agents, as suggested, placed the bomb in all three rooms two months ago. Then when the time was right, it returned to the desired area near the mountain and activated the explosive from a safe distance by hitting the switch taking out Hania and his bodyguard, along with the destruction of this part of the room. Let's take a look at scenario two. There were reports from some witnesses that an object was seen flying from the mountainous region and exploded late at night. The object we're talking is this spike-long range multi-purpose anti-tank missile system is designed to engage modern armored vehicles, double reinforced fortifications and enemy personnel at any time of day and in difficult weather conditions. This missile has a range of 200 meters to 4 kilometers, which is well below the guest house. Here are the various parts of the missile. 
The hominy head of the missile, known as the spike ER, is located in the nose section. Behind it, there is an electronics unit and a leading charge of the cumulative warhead, followed by the main engine. In the central part of the missile's hull, there is a gyroscope and an accumulator battery, the main charge of the warhead with a safety and arming mechanism, and a fuse. The folding steering fins open as soon as they are out of the launcher, steering drives, launch engine, and fiber optic cable reel are located in the missile's tail section. This is how it might have happened. Around 2 a.m., approximately two operatives began moving closer to the building, staying within a range of around 2.4 miles, which is around 4 kilometers. Once in position, the assassin or alleged Mossad operative activated the missile system. They used thermal imaging to see in the dark and guided the missile through an optical wire. This technology allowed the operator to precisely control the missile's trajectory, even in low visibility conditions. The view from the scope likely provided the operative with a clear visual of the target, guiding the missile towards its destination. The missile, as described, has two warheads. A precursor warhead at the front and the main warhead at the rear. The precursor warhead is designed to penetrate reinforced structures, such as double-layered concrete walls. Upon breaching the initial barrier, the main warhead then detonates inside the room, causing significant damage. The power and impact of the missile could have potentially destroyed three runes in the guest house. It's important to note that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard reported that a short-range projectile weighing 7 kilograms was launched from outside the compound consistent with the described attack. This information aligns with the possibility of an external assault using a missile system like the Spike. And the final third scenario involves using a stealth fighter jet like the F-35. However, Iran's air defense forces include the S-300, a Russian long-range surface-to-air missile defense system. Iran purchased the S-300 from Russia in late 2016 for $800 million. Given this, I doubt Israel would risk a $100 million aircraft for a single target, such as this guest house in Tehran, especially considering the potential for being targeted from every angle. Therefore, what I think is happening is that a short-range missile like this one might be used instead, but in the fog of war, any one of these could be a possibility. We also make original engineering content, so please subscribe and hit the notification bell for more videos. Story from ABC News, Israel, it is now confirmed, numerous reports is behind the pager explosions. Sources say, as Hezbollah vows reckoning, I'm hearing reports that Israel is now in a, secure, a state of uh, security lockdown or high alert over fear of reprisal after 2,800 people were injured. I'm going to say this right off the bat. For this segment, for those watching, the quick version of the story is yesterday news, news broke. Thousands of pagers exploded, injuring Hezbollah fighters. I think, again, without condemning or condoning, it is one of the most brilliant, sophisticated, difficult military operations I've heard of. And it could be because I've not heard of the ones that are secret. But the degree of organization that Israel put into this is terrifying. It's terrifying at how powerful and, and, and wow. I am impressed, deeply impressed that they pulled this operation off and were able to plant pagers among thousands of Hezbollah fighters. Now, there are questions about collateral damage, and I'm not saying I, I condone what they did. I'm just saying anyone who's reasonable can recognize the sophistication of this is one of the it's, it's going to go down in the history books. This is going to be in the history books. I tell you, we do have a debate over whether or not this was terrorism because these, these detonations are happening in civilian areas, and I do think we should talk about that. I'm going to give you my thoughts as well. ABC News reports, Israel was behind the deadly explosion of pages across Lebanon on Tuesday, sources told ABC News. At least 12 civilians were killed, and at least 2,800 people injured in the explosions, according to, these Lebanese, to Lebanese authorities. Around 460 of the injuries were critical and required surgery. Lebanese Health Minister Faras Abiyad said, most victims are suffering from eye and facial injuries, while others suffered injuries to hands and fingers. Likely what happened is that people's pagers got an alert. They picked them up, and it blew up in their faces. Now, for those that are wondering what happened, Hezbollah in Lebanon uses pagers because Israel can intercept cell communications. The idea is Israel may intercept a pager signal, 
but you can then use a landline to communicate with, with your source or whatever, and that Israel can't get access to. Apparently, Israel somehow intercepted a shipment of pagers that was headed to Hezbollah, was able to plant small amounts of explosives in all of them, and then waited a very long time. They had no idea. There are many people that are terrified as to what this means. Some are worried about whether they can buy products or whatever. Now, here's the fascinating thing I will say about ABC News. They say 12 civilians were killed. I'm sorry, you're, you're, you're giving me the Lebanese government line in a war. Ha the Hezbollah militant group said it was conducting a security and scientific investigation into the explosion of pages across Lebanon on Tuesday. I, I, I think we're going to need an independent assessment about were, this, were they actually civilians who died or were they Hezbollah militants? Because right now, if you just say there were civilians and people were injured, well, then the argument is going to be pressed that Israel was targeting civilians. But the actual reporting initially is that Hezbollah militants suffered this. Now, there is a question about whether or not we should approve of or condemn, condemn or condone, detonating explosives in civilian population areas because civilians will be injured by this. They go on to say Hezbollah said 11, 11 of its members were killed on Tuesday, though, as is typical of in statements, they did not specify how they died. So 12 civilians were killed, 11 members. Oh, hold on there a minute. If you're saying 12 civilians died and Hezbollah is saying 11 of its members died, we're not getting uh, 23 is the number. That is to imply the civilians listed as dead and the Hezbollah fighters are one and the same. There may be an extra civilian death. Quote, we hold the Israeli enemy fully responsible for this criminal aggression, which also targeted civilians and led to the deaths of a number of martyrs and the injury of a large number with various wounds, Hezbollah said. In a Wednesday morning statement, Hezbollah said it would continue operations to support Gaza and vowed a reckoning for Israel for the massacre on Tuesday. The dead and injured include people who are not members of Hezbollah. Lebanese officials said that an eight-year-old girl and 11-year-old boy are among the dead. Israel has not commented on its alleged involvement in the apparent attack, which prompted chaos in the capital, Beirut, and elsewhere in Hezbollah's South Lebanon heartland. Around 100 hospitals received wounded people, the Lebanese Ministry of Public Health said, with hospitals in Beirut and the southern suburb quickly filling the capacity. Patients were then directed to other hospitals outside the region. The Iranian ambassador to Lebanon, Moshtaba Amani, probably pronouncing it wrong, was among those who had one of the pagers and was injured in an explosion Tuesday, according to Iranian state TV. The diplomat said in a phone call that he was feeling well and fully conscious, according to Iranian state TV. At least 14 people were also injured in targeted attacks on Hezbollah members in Syria, according to the Syrian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Axios is reporting that Israel conducted the Lebanon uh, pager attack. They pushed up their timeline, fearing that Hezbollah was figuring out what was about to happen. They say Israel decided to blow up pagers carried by Hezbollah uh, out of concern its secret operation might have been discovered by the group. The attack took place as tensions rise between Israel and Hezbollah, which U.S. officials are highly concerned will devolve into an all-out war. The AP says exploding pagers and an attack on Hezbollah were made by a Hungarian company, another firm says. Get this. Some rumors indicate speculation. The pages were made by a Taiwanese company, but Taiwan says that these were uh, delivered to uh, maybe a Hungarian or Bulgarian company or something else. We don't know. AP is saying it was made by a Hungarian company. Some reporting is that there was a that one of the companies in question was a shell company, meaning Israel may have set up a fake company knowing Hezbollah was looking for pagers and then actually was the supplier of explosives to Hezbollah. Now, there are questions. They say, uh, Noah, uh, we have a super chat coming right now. Noah Sanders says, Daily Wire just sent a, a story. A second Israeli strike against Hezbollah on walkie-talkies happening today. Breaking news. Holy crap. Let's grab this one. If we can get this. Uh, I'm going to pull this one up in real time. Wow. Holy crap, my friends. This is unprecedented. Also, shout out to Am I Racist. I'm such a big fan, Matt. You nailed it. But anyway. This breaking news right now, Israel detonates thousands of Hezbollah walkie-talkies in second strike. Holy crap. Wow. Look, 
You're, you can criticize Israel all you want, but I'm going to say this. They are not to be trifled with. I am. Let me just put. OK, look, my point is war is bad. We don't want war. I'm just saying. I have never been more shocked by the sophistication of Israel's military tactics. I can say Hezbollah's firing rockets into Israel. I'm not going to get into this whole argument about who started what or when or why. I, I don't know. I'm telling you this. If you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. Daily Wire reports Israel reportedly conducted a second wave of mass precision bombing against Iranian-backed Hezbollah terrorist organization on Wednesday, detonating thousands of walkie-talkies used by the group. Quote, Israel blew up thousands of personal radios, which were used by Hezbollah members in Lebanon, in a second wave of its intelligence operation, which started on Tuesday with the explosions of Hezbollah pagers. Oh, my God. I mean, this is this attack has the capability of ending operations in Lebanon. The the fear, the chaos, the destabilization that could be caused by this is the kind of attack that could have Lebanon dropping to its knees and saying, Israel, please, please stop. You guys got to understand the chaos they have sown with a second attack. You don't know which devices now are implanted with explosives at any minute. This is terrifying. Israel, if they were to claim responsibility here, could say to Lebanon, these are not the only devices. Certainly, we're not going to tell you. You are now going to have to spend tens to hundreds of millions in you. Go ahead right now. Destroy every electronic in the in the country. You have no idea. They could say it's not just walkie talkies. Israel could even say a certain lot of TVs. Israel could say, oh, yeah, the TVs you guys have in your homes. The TV could say your cell phones. The TV, they, they use pagers to communicate, but they may have still, still, still have cell phones. The fear and the chaos that this is, is, has wrought, it, it could seriously result in Lebanon just standing down. Now, like it's likely. I think it's likely to escalate, but the scale of this now with walkie-talkies, he added... The personal radios that were booby-trapped in advance by Israeli intelligence services and then delivered to Hezbollah were part of the malicious emergency communication system, which is supposed to be used during a war with Israel. Oh, my God. Ladies and gentlemen, they detonate the pagers, leaving thousands injured. They wait. Hezbollah then grabs their walkie-talkies to begin communicating because their pagers are are gone. The walkie-talkies then blow up. Wow, man. I don't like war. But I'm not I'm not going to get involved in who who's deserving of what I'm not playing that game. That is not for me. You got people posting videos of children getting hurt and all stuff. I'm not a fan of collateral damage. But we're talking about a, a region at war. And all I can say is as a military tactic. Oh, my God. I, I, I. The first round of explosions related to the walkie talkie and pager attack incident occurred in Lebanon's capital, Beirut. This also affects several other areas of the country at around 1545 local time, which translates to 345 p.m. The blasts continue to occur throughout the country for two days. This attack also allegedly targeted mobile phones, laptops, solar energy cells, as well as walkie-talkie radios that were purchased at a similar time about five months earlier as the exploding pagers. This is the Icon branded walkie talkie, a widely recognized and reliable communication device often used in various industries and by professionals for secure long range communication. Let's take a closer look inside this walkie talkie to better understand its main components. At the front, you'll notice the LCD monitors. Next, we have the microphone, which captures the user's voice and converts sound into electrical signals that can be transmitted. Finally, at the back of the device is the power source, typically a lithium-ion battery. To help illustrate how similar technology could be reproposed in dangerous scenarios, let's examine how a bomb works. In essence, constructing a bomb requires four key elements, power source to provide the necessary energy, a triggering mechanism to initiate the detonation, a main explosive charge to cause the destructive force, and a detonator to set off the explosive. Applying this to a hypothetical scenario, the lithium-ion battery could easily serve as the power source in such a device. 
An explosive charge such as a dynamite or a similar material could be hidden within a seemingly ordinary object like the top section of a cell phone. In a recent attack, for example, the explosive material used was pentaerythrinyl tetranitrate, or PETN for short. PETN is a highly explosive chemical compound known for its potency, and it belongs to a class of chemicals called nitrate esters, which are often used in explosives due to their reactive nature. A detonator could be placed just beneath the explosive charge to ensure precise timing of the explosion. As for the triggering mechanism, something as inconspicuous as the antenna could be used to receive a signal that initiates the detonation. Once everything is in place, a message or radio signal could be sent to activate the bomb, resulting in an explosion designed to target and eliminate high-value individuals such as commanders and soldiers. Let's take a look into the origins of the walkie-talkie. This is a Japanese-based radio communications and telephone company. Interestingly, the company announced that the production of several models of their ICOM handheld radios was discontinued 10 years ago. So where and how they were counterfeited still remains a mystery. Now moving on to the origins of pagers is a bit trickier. Five months before the explosion, a Hungarian company called BAC Consulting bought the licensing rights from a Taiwanese company named Gold Apollo. Unconfirmed reports suggest that the company shipped the products, and at some point along the supply chain, explosives were planted along the way. The products were then shipped back to Hezbollah. To help you understand better, let's simplify the shipping routes. Hezbollah ordered the pagers from Hungary, but the products were allegedly made in Taiwan or somewhere nearby. Afterward, they were reshipped to Lebanon from Hungary, and that should have been the supply chain. A quick recap and correction with this pager. Inside a typical pager, you'll notice these components working together, particularly the batteries which power the device. Now let's consider a hypothetical scenario. Imagine you're looking at two identical batteries inside the pager. Although this is speculative, if it were part of a spy agency, we might consider disguising one of the two identical batteries for a different purpose. One battery would provide the necessary power for the device, while the other could potentially serve as an explosive cleverly concealed within the pager. Hey, come see us on tour. Be in Tempe, Arizona, Burbank, California, and we're going to be in Honolulu, January 11th. Go to jimmydoor.com for a link for tickets. Dave Portnoy, who I love for his pizza reviews, is a Zionist. And that's that's very heartbreaking. A lot of people I like are Zionists. It's hard, it, Why, uh, It's heartbreaking. It really is. If you're programmed not to know what you don't know, how, how are they going to know? Like, that is, first of all, Hezbollah, as soon as you say Hezbollah, that means it's justified in the minds of 70% of the people. Right. I don't, like, Hezbollah, as far as I can tell, what are they, a political party? I don't know what they are, but I've always heard of them as bad terrorists. That's all I've ever heard of them as. I don't know anything about them. So what, how do we feel about Al-Qaeda relatives that got killed? I remember how I felt, man, yeah, whatever, don't be families with terrorists. So these people are still in this mindset, and now that we've got this Democrat, awful, nightmare, wokey bullshit, the conservatives, they, they all yearned for the days when we knew who the bad guys were, and they wore hats that weren't like our hats, and the, Israel was the good guy. They yearned for those days. So they don't want to hear about the kids. Like, yeah, whatever, war sucks. Kid Rock Talk. Nagasaki, Hiroshima. What are you going to do? Nagasaki, Hiroshima. 70% of people are on that. And America programmed us that way. And so here's the, here's the horrible reactions. Here's the horrible reactions. And Dave Portnoy says, I can't wait to watch when this becomes a spy movie. This is the craziest counterterrorism plot I've ever heard. And he's referring to Israel uh, blowing up pagers Inside residences, inside hospitals, inside grocery stores, inside cafes. Hey, maybe he can go get pizza with that girl whose face blew the fuck off, or yeah. he can make a little, a yeah. little. Uh, a there's quick a, there's a nine year old girl's face got blown off by a pager. Why don't and, you look at her face and eat pizza? You and fuck. he's calling this counter terrorism. So it's okay when Israel blows up little kids. Of course, but, it, but nobody likes to blow up kids. They have to. They have to. It is real. But Hamas are the but Hamas when they do it, it's justifying that you go do it. But when you, and you do it, you shouldn't even talk about it. Not only are they allowed to do that, you're wrong for talking, for talking about, about it, it. And you should have your phone hacked with high-end state actor hacking equipment. So, another hero falls, Dave Portnoy falls for the 
garbage Zionism propaganda. He's siding with the Nazis. Because that's well, what modern day the, modern day Zionism is Nazism. That's what it is, and it's all it's mean. all based on lies. He, it's default. all based that's on lies. Position. If you know if you know anything about it, he doesn't. But you don't. He doesn't know tell me about what it. the Nakba was. Just that. All you have to do. Tell me what the Nakba was. What was the Belfort Declaration? Oh, I'll tell you. I'll be Dave Portnoy and tell you. The Nakba was when the Israel begged the Palestinians to live with them, but the Palestinians we won't share with Jews. Yeah, oh. That's the story. There's a movie that was made about it. I don't know if Charlton Heston was in it. Somebody. It was like a. And it came out right when they around Israel founding, and that lie is from a movie that was put out. And to, my ex girlfriend told me that story. Many people who I know to be good people told me that story because they think that's what the Nakba is. They think the Nakba is that. Oh it's my not, god! Not falling. It's not falling for it. It's the default thing you're told. So to not to learn about it, like I'm so I'm not like sorry I know about it, but. It's traumatic to find out the truth. And a lot of these people don't want to deal with the truth. Much like my friend that texted me today wants to pretend that Trump talking about doggies and kitties is the worst thing because he's a rich guy. And they don't want to have a nine-year-old girl blown off face by the good guys on their conscience. And they don't like you bringing it up. They don't you, think you that. Yeah, yeah, they think the worst thing is that Trump talked about dogs and cats and not the worst thing that we Rex Haiti occupied it, stole all their natural resources, screwed over their people and made them desperate enough to move to America. That's not the horrible part. The horrible part is Trump said dogs and cats. I know. I know. I know. Yeah, but not Hillary, not Hillary built trafficking children out of there. That, yeah. That's not the worst part. That's not the that's worst that's part. That's a conspiracy thing. I, I I can't believe he's doing so. That. So Ian Carroll comes on underneath Dave Porter and says it was a terrorism plot, not a counterterrorism plot. This is terror. This is just straight up terrorism. This isn't counterterrorism. Setting off bombs in residential areas surrounded by civilians with no awareness of location is terrorism. So I know Dave Portnoy doesn't know this because he doesn't associate with anybody who's willing to tell him this. So I'm I'm willing to t to tell them this in a video. If you tell people, I, in person, I'll talk to people and I'll bring up minor things that are not. I don't even question Zionism or Israel's right to exist. To me, that's beside the point. The terrorist acts going on now, I'll bring up, and they go, ah, they just want to change the subject. They don't, I don't even want to get into it. So just if they think you know something, they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. It's just like during COVID when I would talk to the top comedians in comedy yeah. in the United States. And they were just like, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. So what is terrorism? Setting off bombs in residential areas surrounded by civilians with no awareness of location is terrorism. Da, 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 da. Yeah, sorry, my control. So, I don't so this hear. isn't counterterrorism. This is just straight up terrorism. Just so you know. Well, here's Glenn Greenwald. He's going to he's going to break down some of the most horrific reactions to this. Oh. Watch. Far right lunatic Grant Glenn Greenwald. Watch this. <laughs> now, some of the reactions from Israel's most fanatical supporters in the United States are so telling. Even as they were hearing that the casualty count was in the thousands, even as they were hearing that it injured or severely or killed young children, they couldn't hide their giddiness, their glee. They're so happy, especially over the psychosexual part of this attack, namely that, oh, Hezbollah had, oh, Hezbollah fighters had their testicles blown off. This was a major source of celebration from these kind of deranged supporters of Israel who often express their views in that manner. Here from Eric Reiner, who is a very wealthy hedge fund manager, although he is an American, an American citizen born in the United States. This is what he said, quote, we were inside of Hania's bedroom, referring to the killing of the Hamas leader in Israel, and now we are inside of Nasrallah's pants, referring to the Hezbollah leader. So we were inside of his bedroom, and now we're inside his pants. Now, the disturbing psychosexual imagery of that is obvious. No one needs to point it out. But the question I had, and I asked, I haven't gotten an answer from him yet, is congratulations. Who is the we in the, these two sentences? Is that about an American citizen who apparently considers the we, not his own country, not the, the American government, that he is subject to and supposed to be loyal to as a citizen, but apparently Israel is someone that he considers we. I think, obviously, there are a lot of uh, American Jews and American evangelicals who think that same way, even though under this new law that the House passed, that the Senate is preparing to pass one of the prohibited ideas that would be constituted as anti-Semitism under this new free speech attack to protect Israel, as we covered when the House uh, passed it, is one of the ideas that is now off limits that would be instantly deemed anti-Semitic is to suggest that any American Jews have 
equal loyalty to or more loyalty to Israel than they do to the United States, even though so many of them say exactly that, admit that, make that so clear. Here is a official account of uh, the Israeli war room, and they simply posted the phone emoji, obviously taunting and celebrating the people who they blow up today. Here's Ben Shapiro speaking of American Jews who have at least as much loyalty, if not more so, to Israel. I'm going to say that while it's still legal. And he went on Twitter and said, quote, breaking, Hezbollah has been forced to rename itself Hezah, Hezah after losing all of its balls. So you kind of see the nature of this attack and the reason why it's arousing so many of Israel's most fanatical supporters, even if you think it's a justified attack, knowing that there were so many civilians who were injured or killed should and any decent person preclude this kind of celebration, but these people are the opposite of decent. Speaking of whom, Constantine Kizin, who is a British uh, and Jewish supporter of Israel, to say, put that mildly, said, quote, what use is 72 virgins when you have no balls? The longtime American neocon Eli Lake, also a fanatical supporter of Israel, said, can't talk right now, my pater's blowing up. So they were having a lot of fun with this show of strength, and obviously they identified very much with Israel. Even though they're not Israeli citizens, nominally they are citizens of the U.S. or the U.K. Uh, it's probably one of the most deranged people, but I don't even think he's more deranged. I think he just hides it less. Is the actor Michael Rappaport, who has become one of the most obnoxious and vocal, attention-seeking supporters of Israel. And as the news proliferated today that there were thousands of casualties, including children killed, this is what he went onto his phone and then social media to do. Beep, beep. <laughs> All right, these people are just deranged. They're, they're degenerates to respond to violence, including the death of children, in that manner. <laughs> well, ask any comedy club that had to work with Michael Rappaport, ask any of the employees how that was, and they would rather have their dicks blown off by a pager, I promise you. <laughs> That's true. That's 100% true. I've repeatedly around the country, people, you know this dick Michael Rappaport? Nothing to do with Israel. He's just that much of a piece of shit. So those are the fantastic reactions. And tell me Zionism isn't a mental illness. It's a mental illness that uh, infects almost everyone in our government. Almost everyone in our government, almost everyone in our media, except for the people they fired at MSNBC. And even Mehdi Hassan turned into another shit lib the other day. So he's doing the both sides thing. Because he wants his job back. He wants. Oh. Yeah, that's right. I, I guess his. I guess his his YouTube show isn't taking off like he thought it would. Oh, it turns out he should go back to his classic old roots, his acoustic stuff, where he was like the kafirs and, you know, this far right, radical Islamic thing. I bet that's now is probably a, a a real good time to start it money wise. And so what they're reacting yeah, to is. All right. So between pagers and walkie talkies and solar panels and all that good stuff. Um, my question would be, if you could do all that stuff to Hezbollah, why didn't you do that to the Hamas leaders and spare all the women and children over the past almost a year at this point? But I guess none of the mainstream media outlets would find benefit in asking such a question. But I think Hezbollah is probably going to have a new rule. It's BYOP, bring your own pager, and uh, they're going to question where their consumables come from from now on of the electronic variety. What do you think, Scott? Ah, man. I mean, when I first heard this story, I was just like, whoa, again. That's it's like an onion right story, there, dude. Yeah, it really is. It's just crazy. So that's a good point that you just made. Like, I hadn't even considered that, where it's the idea that, you know, if they have the capability and the wherewithal to do such targeted att attacks in, in situations like this, then it kind of actually really kind of spotlights the fact that they really are trying to create some sort of uh, conditions ethnic where the, yeah, as in the cleansing where these people are getting wiped out with no chance of returning or repopulating the area. So that's definitely significant. But, uh, you know, it really is interesting, like how many pieces had to fall into place, like this huge story of international intrigue and shell corporations spanning multiple countries and just uh, the planning and f that went into all of this. Like, it's just like, wow. 
It also oh, wow. occurs to me that Israel doesn't necessarily have friendly relations with all the countries that might be involved, but MI6 and the British Empire do, so maybe they had some help. Yep. And and then also, also if they have the wherewithal to, and in some of those other stories that they covered about the uh, assassination in Iran, where it's like they have the wherewithal to plant explosives in situations long before they are needed. So they 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 know that they need to plant a bunch of explosives in certain buildings uh, prior to incidences happening and then triggering those explosives when the time is right. They also seem to be experts <laughs> with shoulder fired missiles, which the alleged Trump assassination teams might or might not be using. Yeah. 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 So I don't know if, if you think get... about it, they started with a two, two, three, and then they went to like a seven, six, eight, whatever the AK 47 sniper rifle variant. I forget what the, the name of that rifle was. Anyway, it's a bigger round. So it makes sense. Like it's time they've had, you know, two misses, two missed opportunities that they would go to the shoulder fired <laughs> RPG type missiles at this point. Fair enough. Yeah, I hope people picked up on the 9/11 reference in that last. See, yeah. see, like, like having the fourth, the fourth thought plan explosives ahead of time. And anyway, the <laughs> WTC seven didn't kill itself. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and all the squibs on the two all, going yeah. down, dude. Like, come on, yeah, now. falling Let's into go. their footprints, which was very convenient because, like, if you just follow the rules without 9/11. Right. Like if 9 11 was, if it didn't happen, what happens with those buildings? Because they built them, tallest buildings in the world at the time in the 1970s. What was the plan to deconstruct those buildings in one of the most valuable pieces of real estate downtown? The building has a duration. They, they know how long it's going to last and when, when it has, you know, it's going to be failing inspection because of corrosion in the joints and stuff like that. Right. So the, the buildings are built, the buildings have a lifespan. Prior to 9-11, what was the legal, legitimate way to deverticalize those buildings? Those insurance companies, those owners would have never paid the fees. Those buildings had asbestos in them. Those buildings were just downgraded from commercial level A to commercial level C property, which means they couldn't charge as much for that real estate. You couldn't use cell phones consistently in the building. It didn't have modern cable amenities, all these other things that they needed, and they were obsolete. So it was very convenient that Al-Qaeda came along and made Larry Silverstein and his investors so many billions of dollars. And that AIG and Marsha McLennan and the CIA's involvement and the insider trading and all that stuff, that was all just convenient. You don't have to worry about it. It was the guys with the box cutters who have a different culture than you and whose skin might be darker than yours. They're the ones who did it. Let's go bomb them for 20 years in a variety of places, Iraq, Afghanistan, all over the place. So if you take the stories on face value, shame on you. Uh, if you start looking into the stories and start to find the truth, good for you. That's how it works. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there's more, how... more clips to learn from <clears throat> in tonight's session, for sure. For sure. Yeah, that's how we roll around here, man. And uh, you know Spielberg's already making a movie about this, too. You know. Of course. Yeah, of course. I mean, this is this is very... I don't know, man. Like, it's it's kind of spooky, you know, at this point. It's like... It is. Watch what we say. I'm not going to get any new equipment anytime soon. So That's right. We're good. Antique equipment is the way to go. <laughs> yeah. Everything's yeah. going to become clear. That's what yeah. they want. Everything clear so you can see inside. Yeah. So you know that the, oh, that's a real transistor. How do you know what a real transistor even looks like? See, yeah. it gets back to the ignorance on our part of the grammar of the things we surround ourselves with and our lack of understanding in the things that we use on a consistent basis. Twice a year, I teach a course called Autonomy. It's a 12-week course. It teaches leadership, entrepreneur skills, executive skills, all these types of things that I saw were taken out of our education system in order to make the schooling or indoctrination system that we've all probably went through. And it has served us well enough to be interchangeable cogs in the machine of the globalists. But if we want a homestead, if we want uh, a write our own ticket, work from home job, work from anywhere type of situation... They're not exactly handing those out at the end of college. They give you a piece of paper and they're like, good luck. So reality is dropping us off here, but the demands of reality are up here. So I created autonomy to help people close that gap for themselves so they can level up their skills to the demands of the situations that life is putting in front of us presently. Life's demands of intellect and understanding precision and complexity are ever increasing. The schooling didn't prepare us for it. The media is not going to do anything but reinforce what schooling prepared us for. And so we're going to have to take a leadership position, 
and take steps off the beaten path to kind of blaze our own trail in life. What makes the Grand Theft World podcast unique, invigorating, exciting, and informative? Most other podcasts out there are either doing straight up interviews or they're just covering the daily news. They're covering current events from the day they happened. And that is effective. It's useful. It's a great starting point. And then sometimes these current events change during the week past the first story. So we like to give it a little time. You have to wait till some of the dust settles on these stories in order to give them accurate coverage. And the other thing that's really missing in the media landscape is covering the articles that are coming out every day. That's great. That's necessary. But who's bringing in contextual history so that you can understand what has been going on for decades and decades to lead up to the machinations and actions that we see unfolding today. So what we do here on the podcast is we cover current events. Many of these things are censored, but we wait about a week. As a forensic historian, I focused mainly through my career on the history of globalism and collectivism and things that they call maybe the new world order. There's a lot of facts to these sort of circumstances, groups, events, activities, working groups that they've had over time. So for Grand Theft World listeners, we not only break down the current events, most of which that are censored during the week, we provide you with contextual history. We give you the source notes, the references. We do deep dives, and this really empowers you with an understanding of context and history so that you can make more informed decisions in your life. There's also a community, a membership where you guys can actually ask questions and we can get into the show and share evidence. And there's a town hall weekly for Grand Theft World for those who listen to it and are interested in covering the stories that we don't get to during a six hour show. Listening to it an hour a day, you could uh, easily consume the week's news, but you're gonna have substance and meaning and context and understanding. And with that, you can make higher quality decisions in your life. So if you're interested, in more quality in your life, go to grandtheftworld.com, click podcast at the top, and we'll see you there. Thank you. These allegations are false. This isn't Grand Theft Auto, folks. This isn't a video game. What are the most surprising things that you discovered once you started pulling on that thread, who he was connected to, what institutions he was influential over, what events he participated in? Come on, man. What are you talking about? Uh-huh. You don't have to think about it, dude. I got this quote because uh, you said you didn't know much about Klaus Schwab. I made it my job to, as soon as this happened, I'm like, okay, this guy's their front man. Let me learn about the official history of the World Economic Forum. I got their 40 year history. I got every book that Klaus Schwab has written or ghost written. I went through those books. This is one of the most interesting passages. Come on, man. Come on.